everyone, and welcome to City Age Virtual. My name is Selma Shilbaya. I'm a former CNN journalist and a current professor of communications at Clayton State University. I'm also the founder of Shilbaya Consulting, a communication firm that focuses on strategy development, storytelling, communication training, and coaching. And I am delighted to be your MC for today's episode of City Age Virtual. Now, while we're waiting for everyone to join in, we want to invite you to introduce yourself via Zoom chat. So before you do that, please make sure to first change your two to be directed to all panelists and attendees so that we can all view what you're saying. And please tell us your name, where you're Zooming from, and any hats that you want to share with us today that relates to the conversation. And as a reminder, we also want to encourage you to engage with us on social media throughout the conference today via LinkedIn, Twitter, as well as Facebook. Be sure to tag us on all your posts and use hashtag CityAge. We want to also hear from you throughout the program. So please use the Q&A portion of the Zoom at the bottom of your screen and ask any questions to our speakers and panelists throughout the sessions. We'll also be asking you a couple of poll, three actually, poll questions throughout the sessions. Now, let's get this program started. Our first poll question is gonna pop up on your screen right now, and we want you to take a minute uh, or so to answer it. Do you believe there is a systematic discrimination in the financing of entrepreneurs of color? So we're gonna let you take a couple of seconds and answer that question as the results come in. All right. All right. And I see we've got folks in the chat from everywhere joining us. Welcome, welcome on board. Andre, Jelani, Larry. Everyone here, we've got lots of folks joining. All right, so we'll let those results come in as we go and we'll revisit them again later. Entrepreneurs of Color is designed to bring us together today to begin addressing one of America's great challenges, the lack of a level playing field for minority entrepreneurs. The numbers are shocking. According to the Kaufman Foundation and Living Cities, at least 77% of venture capital is invested in white. Only 1% of the venture backed founders are black. Fewer than 1.3% of the 69.1 trillion in global assets under the four major asset classes, that's mutual funds, hedge funds, real estate and private equity are managed by white women and people of color. And only 1% of the total assets are managed by black people. Let those figures sink in. There are many historical reasons for this inquiry, of course, but the fact is that this imbalance of access to capital means that Black, Brown, and Indigenous entrepreneurs essential to build their communities are at a serious disadvantage. For America, this means we are missing out on the talents of millions of entrepreneurs of color. We are here today with our partner, Color, to look at the systematic problems to some degree, but mostly we are here to look at how to fix this imbalance and learn from successful entrepreneurs who have overcome these barriers to success and want to help others achieve their full potential as well. Our first speaker is founder and CEO of We Are Marcus, an online character development tool for students. Previously, he was a highly recognized teacher in Bedford-Stuyvesant, Brooklyn, a contract manager on behalf of Barack Obama's 2012 presidential campaign in Virginia, and later an education consultant in multiple states. He has been featured in Black Enterprise and On the Rise magazines as, social, as a social innovation leader. Please welcome Christopher King, CEO of We Are Marcus, professor at Howard University, Next Gen Venture Partners, and Score Three Ventures. Welcome on board, Christopher. Thank, thank you for you. coming. Thank you, thank you. Welcome uh, to everybody taking place, taking part in this conversation. Uh, this is a unique setting in which I am uh, likely going to talk at you a little bit. Uh, just the nature of the medium. Uh, most sessions I lead are sort of 
like a little bit more engagement, but what we're gonna do is uh, we'll leave time at the end for, uh, for us to uh, ask questions in the Q&A and uh, share your experience, but also ask me any questions you might have. Today's talk, uh, I, I'm gonna talk about how I, I built a venture uh, and have expanded into other businesses. I consult and I educate, and uh, I also am connected to VC uh, investment networks as my way of essentially uh, trying to solve problems along the way for founders of color and uh, for the growing uh, uh, community of people interested in entrepreneurship and uh, need some advisement or interested in breaking into the into the space. So at the end, I'll also leave an opportunity for you to get directly in touch with me via Twitter or LinkedIn. Uh, and I'll share my insights with the um, uh, competition and product market fit. That's really important for us to level set the conversation uh, today. Because I'm a professor, I'm gonna go into that and make sure we're all sort of using similar language and you can follow along my journey as I've sort of learned uh, intensely about what it takes to pitch to uh, investment um, interests, whether that be you know, uh, uh, various funding stores, uh, sources, philanthropy, uh, and um, and government sources for funding as well. Uh, and I'll share some of my reflections as well as uh, uh, what what's next for for me and and some of my business partners. I want to stress again that this is beyond just me, right? So Fundera put together this statistical analysis that says some sixty percent of of business owners. Uh, black business owners uh, have, have uh, experienced some um, distress during the COVID-19 pandemic. I'd venture to say this number is higher than 60, right? Uh, we all know somebody who's been affected by the pandemic. Uh, within my own network, I've, I've, I know uh, several people have tested positive and some who've lost family members. Uh, this is a very serious time and uh, pivots um, you know, are, are important. And I'll talk to you a bit about what I've learned I started talking earlier about chasing problems and hacking solutions. Uh, this chart on the right uh, or on the left side of your screen uh, shows you know, what kind of control you wanna have over your company, um, unintended on my last name being included in this slide, uh, but either you fail, uh, you're, you're going to be uh, immensely rich and that's your goal. Uh, I personally think that you know, we need to have a social impact uh, uh, to, given the nature of this, the seriousness of the problem of not only raising capital, but scaling a business within our communities that we need to think beyond just the rich bucket uh, and beyond the king bucket. Uh, so um, I, I think there's something to be said here about your, us grounding the conversation there. I wanna uh, be clear to you guys that, I, you know, there's a sort of things that I, the things that I am and things that I'm not. And I wanna point out that I'm a non-technical founder. When I started my company in 2015, I, uh, I did not know how to write a line of code. That did not deter me. Uh, instead, what I started to think about, uh, you know, within that realm of what I'm not, the things that I could learn, the things that I could be conversational in, and um, you know, I, I I got excited about the vision that I could create. I wrote down a business plan, and um, it wasn't very good, but it was good enough to attract some people that were in my my network to help me. Uh, engage in marketing and product development. And I was essentially thinking strategy and business development uh, because my experience with contract negotiations and as a business developer at an education management firm, I thought, you know what, I could, I could at the very least, I could communicate our idea and learn how to demo what we had, we had built up until that point. And, and, you know, I can tell you that, you know, my knack for product market fit started to develop at that time. I took some big leaps. At the, uh, I moved from you know one state uh, down to a place I'd never lived before to connect with uh, my father, who you know I was raised in a single parent home, and I you know I took I took the leap. I moved several states. I packed up my bags. I did that more than once on this journey, um, and it has paid off. Um, the other thing that uh, uh, is important to to sort of sit with as I continue uh, this discussion is. Uh, to to seek out these communities of support, accelerators have and incubators have played a critical role for me. Whether that's Conscious Venture Labs, Village Capital, 1776, um, um, 
you know, these these organizations, uh, even the the Black Upstart, uh, you know, introduced information to me and even validated some of my thinking at the time uh, uh, and some of the research uh, that I uh, that I that I ultimately informed my business. So let will set the conversation around what competition and product market fit means. I, we will, you know, I'm sure most people know, you know, who the direct competitor to their to their uh, their venture is and the indirect competitor. Uh, not a great answer to say, as you probably heard before, uh, that there's no competition. Uh, so starting there, uh, Wham Academy is a uh, education uh, technology tool that provides social emotional learning support. Uh, we're in our uh, beta phase now. We're actually refreshing the platform, so we're def definitely excited for folks to. Uh, you know, sign up to be on our journey uh, to, to join our waiting lists or inquire about, um, um, you know, next fall uh, so that you can get onboarded to the platform. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're sort of uh, shortlisting some folks who have seen our evolution who would like to do business with us this this year. But uh, next year is more of a, 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 of, a of a another a refresh of the launch. The point of this slide is that Panorama, Ripple Effects, and uh, Hidden Genius Project all fall into this time versus scale uh, and active users uh, diagram here. So We Are Marcus exists at the intersection, right? So Panorama, they started off doing SEL work and marketing to all kids. And our target segment, we're targeting black and brown youth, middle school and high school, during instructional time, but mostly out of school time. Panorama Suite runs throughout districts, uh, incredible scale and footprint, well-funded. Those are the big boys, right? And, and ripple effects would probably fall underneath there. So when you think about your startup, you want to think about where does this fit in the market as it relates to competition. Uh, so I, I, I point this out to say that, you know, competition also, the last point is it could be cooperation among competition. So as you build your ventures, it's important for you to understand the landscape of who else is in the market and you know, tighten the feedback loop. I think we have typically founders have some anxiety around sharing their ideas with big, big firms. Um, so the, the mid-size firm is, is targeted here in Genius Project. They do a good job of um, targeting our demographics. So they're actually in the same lane. We have similar mission and alignment. Uh, and that, that goes to the point about not just trying to make money, but to try to address and solve a problem. Um, so uh, this is my founder story. I started thinking about who else was, was next to me in direct and, and in the future and beyond. And I want to talk to you about the future because most of you all are, are visionaries and your founders and your business owners. Uh, and and then here's my story, as you, you, you may have seen this meme before. Uh, you know, we, we think it's going to be a straight line, but I think the strength of the reality approach of all the peaks and valleys on this diagram is to think 5, 10, 15 years out. When I started We Are Marcus in 2015, uh, I, you know, I, st I started talking to people about what it could be like to close the mentoring gap by having Black men in, uh, even, even via fixed video, in uh, school settings where we wouldn't have as much logistical pressure around finding the time for the mentor, uh, which essentially hasn't worked. Uh, you know, we, we can do fancy spreadsheets, we can do, you know, volunteer uh, runs, but we, ne we can never really fix time. And our platform essentially does that. Not that digital mentoring in itself is, is, is uh, uh, phenomenally new. However, scaling a platform where we can actually measure character analytics uh, of each student based on their writing is was the novel concept for me at the time. Since then, the connection to the social impact drive is to target these areas, uh, which I didn't know in 2015, 2016, this was part of my bumpy road on reality, is to workshop this idea with, with uh, stakeholders who are interested in the concept and ultimately, we were able to get some. We were able to win a challenge competition to, to obtain funding from the National Institute of Health. And you think about that and say, the National Institute of Health. Okay, well, that's coronavirus. That's you know, these are public health folks. Public health folks have an interest in uh, the social determinants of health, which I found to be uh, super interesting to me. 
uh, on how uh, our platform could affect substance abuse outcomes, truancy, um, and chronic absences and behavior referrals for students, we were able to do some preliminary studies uh, and draft some paperwork around what that looked like. Um, uh, that, and I want to say paperwork in terms of grant applications for phase one and phase two funding through NIH is a highly technical and highly challenging process, right? Uh, so our, we convened a group of experts and our timing you know, in 2015, 2016, was to think about that, right, at that time. Now we're in uh, this, this, the next big leap is for me to, to, to wholeheartedly, unabashedly, unapologetically believe that the world would care about the community that I was targeting and I was interested in engaging in my business. And here we are in 2021, and we have, you know, the fourth or fifth rising of civil rights activists around black 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 lives but now we have a global movement interested in black people and black life so the question becomes for you know our sponsors and what you've seen um, in these moments is there are resources being allocated not only to fund the ventures but buy the product as well Right. It's not the goal is not to raise money. The goal is to use finance and capital to achieve enhanced traction, right? Scalability, multi-dimensional products, right? So uh, I'll, I'll leave that there. And um, so hopefully we can we can we can push through. There's still some things I want to talk about. Uh, while building your company, uh, the build, measure, learn feedback loop. Anybody who knows me, I, I am I am a BML. I'm a lean startup enthusiast. Uh, some of the things that you should obviously, um, you know, that you should know and spend some time with is, you know, the the, the finance for founders. The idea that uh, you should know the fundamentals of your business from a quantitative perspective, so that it's not just, um, uh, it's not just uh, uh, prose and 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 mission and vision, uh, but it also sort of uh, whittles down to what your you know LTV is or your lifetime value or customer, what your cost of acquisition is. Uh, uh, these are going to inform whether or not you know the investor really understands that you have thought about those numbers. And and most VCs or most investors will say most of that is wrong. Uh, great great job, great attempt on uh, uh, getting there, but. Um, you know, and that sort of bakes into your humility versus your imposter syndrome. Even if you do not know what somebody is talking about in a meeting um, and you're just not clear, you should know that you belong there. You belong there, right? It is your job now to do the homework on learning more about what research and development looks like, what your product roadmap looks like, and how to get out the building and uh, ask the right questions so you can learn how to get, be better. This is truly a journey uh, back to that first meme uh, of an up and down that is, you know, looks different for every company. My path to uh, the investor networks, and uh, I consider myself a sort of rising investor uh, in the space of evaluating and coaching founders and, and also uh, working with companies who are at the early stage and the pre-seed level. Um, I, I've I encourage them to tell their story while they're building their company, which is uh, what I'm modeling for you today. Uh, and I'll, I'll give you a sneak peek at the other ventures that I'm involved in that uh, I think would be, um, I'd like to also tell that story. Uh, and what I also do is, you know, I attend um, weekly and monthly calls on uh, founders in the, the DC, Maryland, Virginia area, and, you know, talk shop, trade, trade horror stories, trade, trade successes, and, uh, if you follow me on LinkedIn, you'll you'll also see that uh, I I am again unapologetically uh, rooting for every black founder and every black kid, uh, and I'm happy to share your story as well. What's next is that uh, through the small partnership of the Small Business Administration and Howard University, where I uh, am a professor. Uh, uh, I uh, have tapped into uh, a research project where I'd like to listen to founders and I'd like to learn from you all on what you're experiencing. Uh, so go to theoadvisors.com. We offer a startup advisory service uh, and that's actually um, launching this month. Uh, we've been working with founders for a long time. So the idea is an advisory network really makes a lot of sense. 
uh, and that'll take you from you know business planning to to through to uh, uh, business development processes. Uh, we have a, a sort of knack for the marketing and sales bucket, but also uh, the business development internally on building your company. So founder coaching is a part of that and founder support. And with a, par a partnership with SeedSpot, we're going to do that research and execute there. Uh, I encourage you to uh, get in touch and stay in touch. Uh, thank you for this time. Uh, I wanted to make it quick and, and, I'm, and I'm hopefully uh, uh, many of the points landed with you. Please connect on uh, Twitter at King Talks. Uh, underscore underscore King Talks and reach out on uh, LinkedIn, Christopher C. King. Thank Thanks. you so much, Christopher, for that. And thank you for sharing the founder story. Uh, it's got lots of insight and, and applicable perspective and, and advice for everyone. So thank you very much. Um, for all of our viewers, if you've got any questions for Christopher, please feel free to put them in the Q&A and we will facilitate uh, with Christopher and make sure that you uh, receive some answers in our follow-up. So let's take a moment now and reflect on our previous poll and introduce a second question for all of you. Let's look at the results that came in from our previous poll, which was, do you believe there is systematic discrimination in the financing of entrepreneurs of color? And it looks like for the most part, we've got a 97% yes, which really um, helps set up our conversations here forward and, and validates how important they are. Let's look at our next question before we move forward into more conversations. Our next poll is, do you personally believe you have equal access to capital? So take a few seconds to respond to that poll question. Do you personally believe you have equal access to capital? And we will review these results as we move on into the program. Now, based in Kansas City, Missouri, the Kaufman Foundation is one of the country's leaders in fostering entrepreneurship in minority communities. They have been a supporter of City H for more than a decade and have helped make today's program possible. We'd like to introduce you to one of Kaufman's leaders in creating just and equitable communities. Ashley Spivey is Program Officer, Entrepreneur Support Organizations, Entrepreneurship at the Ewing Marion Kaufman Foundation. And she's joining us today. Hello, Ashley. Hello, how are you? Good, welcome to the program. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. I'm just getting all my stuff set up. Are you ready for me to go ahead and jump uh -huh. in? It is all yours. The floor is yours. Awesome. Um, well, thank you again, um, everyone, for having me. Thank you to Color, Bridge Tower, and uh, Bridge Tower Media and City Age for putting on um, this dynamic and dope presentations and panels uh, throughout the day. So I, I have multiple screens going, but it's hard to feel a sense of connectedness uh, via uh, technology. So I do ask like use a chat, drop in there how you're feeling, have some conversation as I am kind of going through the presentation as hopefully it'll bring us a little bit closer through um, this virtual space. And before I jump into the presentation, I think it's really important to just acknowledge um, one, that this is Black History Month, right? And so recognizing our ancestors and our elders and the value that Black folks have given to this country and globally through our brilliance and our bodies, okay? And then lastly, um, making sure that we are on borrowed land. So I'm actually right now in Omaha, Nebraska. And so thinking about the indigenous populations um, whose land that we are on and occupying, um, that I also want to pay homage and provide affirmation affirmations in that space. So ask you all to do the same as you think about where you're located, whose land are you occupying? And then again, being a little bit more intentional and a deeper dive into recognizing and reflecting on the value add of Black folks in this country and worldwide. So I am going to pin my picture and I'm going to share my screen. Um, so that you all can see this presentation. Um, hopefully in the chat, give me a thumbs up or through video, if you're able, you should be able to see um, my PowerPoint. Um, but 
it's really important just to name that you all, um, folks in the field, so entrepreneurs, folks that are investing in entrepreneurs, um, folks like me and philanthropy, we all play an extraordinary role in building strong, connected communities. And so I really appreciate and want to name your commitment to that and having this conversation around entrepreneurship as a lever for economic justice. So I will say that I am not a philanthropic professional. Sometimes I wonder how I got in this space. I am a community organizer by trade, like through and through. And so my work is really around justice and liberation and coming to the um, Kauffman Foundation, I felt like that there was a place to marry what I know to be true around organizing in communities of color, specifically black communities, what economic liberation can and should look like and how can we um, bring that to a space that builds chairs and wields power, right? And so I'm excited to be able to have this conversation as we think about economic liberation and justice. How do we use entrepreneurship um, as that lever, really at the intersections, um, again, of racial justice and equity? And you know, you don't always see uh, philanthropy in this space. And so I think it's gonna be a rich conversation around how um, a big institution, right? Again, that holds this power can really create a transformational change. Um, let's see, okay. So I think it's important when we think about, right? Like again, the grounding of Kaufman Foundation to really understand who our founder was. So Ewing Kaufman um, is the donor whose wealth created this foundation. He was a successful entrepreneur and was centered um, and was very centered, practical, and resilient. Mr. Kaufman was a Missouri farm boy um, who grew up poor and he died a billionaire. So really kind of the narrative around the American dream, all the nuances in that too, is really his story. He founded a major pharmaceutical company, Marion Laboratories, which now um, years later is merged into a larger firm and still exists. He also is the founder of the Kansas City Royal. So again, very like a serial entrepreneur um, into building things um, who won a World Series on his watch. And you know, right now for all of my KC folks out there and even the fans, it's a rough time around um, sports and winning. So we are just gonna sit this here and hopefully just bring some comfort after this last week. Um, his principles guide our work, um, again, as our founding, as our founder and, um, and donor. So like, what did he believe, right? Because those values are going to be embedded into how we approach our work. So he believed that everyone deserves a shot at success, regardless of race, income, or background, that we can fundamentally change outcomes of people's lives by tackling root causes, not just treating symptoms, which again, gets into that liberation and justice work. Education is paramount in helping people reach their full potential. Building enterprise is one of the most effective ways to realize individual promise and spur the economy. And finally, he believed that common people like himself can do uncommon things. He truly believed that our country, our world, a full common men, women, folks across, across the gender spectrum are capable of doing uncommon things to create a bold new future. Okay. And so I think it's important to, again, like my, my roots are in community and community organizing. Um, so I also want to name in this space that philanthropy and even this foundation are not above critique. Right, like we can name the harm that philanthropy has caused to communities, especially communities of color, um, in the, the name of like the, that we're wanting to help and uplift. And so I think I want to make sure that I say in this space that as we think about that nuance of philanthropy and the role that we play in our social systems, that Kaufman has an external explicit focus to racial equity. We are really early in this journey and we will continue to fill forward in the work because it's too important not to, it's too important to not step into it. So for my data folks, I am not a data person, but I know that there's some folks out there who like the data and the hard numbers to help them, you know, wrap their minds around what does this look like. And so when we think about um, employers or businesses that, you know, are um, having lots of jobs, are able to provide a living and family wage benefits to community, folks are thinking of like the next big box company, like an Amazon or something like that, right? 
Well, what this chart shows us is something very different. It shows us that startups are actually creating the jobs. While big established companies employ the most people, studies by business age show that in the aggregate, most new job creation comes from new businesses in their first five years. I'm gonna say that again for my non-data folks like me to make sure that we're getting it right. So again, we have this idea that these big box companies, you know, kind of in that same narrative of what does entrepreneurship look like, those are the folks that are providing jobs and providing value to our local economies. And that's not always the case. What we're seeing is that net new job creation comes from new businesses in their first five years. And that's what that blue line is showing. And so when you consider that new businesses are primary means of bringing new ideas to the market, being innovative, adding value, we really see the need of why we need to depend on entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship as a field, right? So there are a ton of studies, reports, memos, brief, like you name it, they have it around the impacts of COVID-19 and the entrepreneurship um, ecosystem. But we had a problem before the pandemic. We do know and can name that the pandemic um, compounded existing inequities, right? Like, again, we talked about, and there was a question around that, the access to capital. So yes, we named that. Um, COVID-19 and then pandemic compounded issues, it may be shown a light for folks who are not um, as aware, but what we have found through the indicators that we track at Kaufman, such as business starts, that American entrepreneurship has been flat for the past couple of decades. In addition, first year job creation by new businesses averages about 5.27 jobs per 1,000 adults nationally. Well, back in the 1990s, which I live in the 90s every day, okay, that's what my playlist has. My son would probably think I dress like I'm um, old age in the 90s, right? Um, that the number was around eight jobs per thousand. So the takeaway is to really understand that fewer companies are starting and they're employing fewer people. Um, so we don't at Kaufman have the answer to this long-term entrepreneurial slump or should we, right? We should be co-creating with the experts and people closest um, in the field to help us through that. Um, but through our research and experiences with communities across the nation, we do see some clear uh, core root issues and symptoms that we can recognize and start to address to see a movement. The first thing that we have to name is institutional inequities like racism and other intersecting isms, right? Again, I, as I mentioned, I'm a community organizer. So if we don't address those core root issues, we're never going to see true momentum or transformational system change. Um, when we cut folks intentionally out of access and opportunity, we won't actualize our communities or our economy to truly thrive. It's an economic imperative for us to name and dismantle racist systemic barriers to entrepreneurship. And this is not news for some of y'all, right? Like y'all are in this space navigating it. I should also say that I'm a business owner. My partner and I own a restaurant here. Um, and so, right, like I work in this space that's working to address these issues and we have to navigate it through our lived experience. And so um, it's important to know that we have to address like the issues to capital access and even culturally relevant business services for us. Um, and at the intersection of these identities, so at the intersection of racial identity and gender identity, for example, these disparities truly, truly worsen. So when you think about and layer on, as I mentioned, the, the global pandemic and economic crisis, we have new and small businesses now at extreme risk. It's been reported that more than 40% of black owned businesses have closed since um, the pandemic has started. And again, it's because there were already barriers that existed and COVID-19 has compounded those. We really need to reimagine, given the um, economic disinvestment in communities of color, that entrepreneurship also does not look like the dominant narrative that exists. I feel like it's always around like these big tech companies or like a Silicon Valley everywhere. And I feel like through my experience and our work at Kaufman, we see that entrepreneurship also takes other narratives and other forms. 
folks of color are running side hustles, hobbies, and businesses that act as second and third income streams because of the economic environment we were intentionally forced into. So when you think about what entrepreneurship can provide, right, again, it gets into that economic liberation or justice in order for communities of color and us to actualize what we need in order to take care of our families, our community, and ourselves. So in this time of crisis, when folks are now paying more attention, right, like we got folks' attention, we need to change the systems and rebuild better. If we address the racism that plagues our systems, I truly believe that we will see a ripple effect that benefits everyone. Again, it's that targeted universalism, right? Like if you address and support the people most disproportionately and most impacted by the core root issue, there will be ripples where everyone benefits. And we know that the brilliant strength and success that, um, that our communities of color possess, right? So it's also not through a deficit mindset that we need to be fixed or that there's all these gaps. Like despite those things that do exist, we have brilliance, we have strengths, we, we have resilience and we are thriving in some of these spaces where um, people didn't think we would. And so imagine what can happen if we work together to dismantle systemic barriers to entrepreneurship that don't allow us to do that, right? So at the foundation, it's really important to think about how philanthropy does this, right? As I mentioned, there's not a ton of philanthropic partners in this uh, space. We are one of the thought leaders um, from a, an institutional philanthropic um, space that says, hey, we are investing in entrepreneurship and economy in that way. And so it's important to see like, how does that look or how does that operationalize? Um, and for us at the foundation, it really means that we're clear on what we stand for. So we seek to build inclusive prosperity through a prepared workforce and entrepreneur fo focused economic development. And on this slide, you can kind of see um, how our theory of change or how our mission, vision, our priorities, and then our strategies all align to actualize that statement. I specifically work on a team that is focused on the Heartland region. So four state geographic area, Missouri, Iowa, Nebraska, and Kansas. And we still do work nationally as a foundation, but we really wanted to see um, what could happen when we could have a more place-based strategy given the similar demographics and trends happening in the four states that I named. And so when you think about entrepreneurship, again, as economic development, or this lever for economic justice, we know that in this region, we are still really focused on large employers and, and around attraction and retention incentives. Again, thinking about who actually are, are employing folks and the difference that means for big box companies. Our state government engagement and entrepreneur support is lacking and absent in our four states. And then there are philanthropic communities or institutions that are willing to invest, but it's still kind of happening. They're, they're not folks that are naming um, this as a priority in their funding strategies. And so again, by taking this place-based strategy, we're hoping to actualize some change in that way. Um, so when we think about our current grant making strategies and, and how we support entrepreneurs and communities of color, this is what this looks like here, okay? And so I'm personally responsible for looking at um, the entrepreneurship challenge bucket that you see. And that's really thinking about what are the issues or opportunities that exist for entrepreneurs, especially those underrepresented in the ecosystem. And how can we build on that? How can we invest in community? How can we collaborate better with community and really, um, um, catalyze new programs or help extend the sustainability and support of existing programs that are working in their area. Um, and then also we launched last year, uh, my good sis Natalie who was in the role before me. Um, this was really her brainchild, but thinking about our social networks and what does it mean when you build champions in this space where you have the tools that you need to do whatever it is that your leadership wants to do in this space. And so we have really started to look at building communities of practice with practitioners and people in formalized roles within the ecosystem, as well as folks that might not have the same language or jargon that we're using, but are doing the work, right? So doing more community-based um, communities of practice. Um, we also do some capacity building programming um, as well as sponsorships. So again, when we think about our strategy within this larger bucket of Kaufman, here's what we're deploying as a philanthropic institution to see change happen within the entrepreneurship space. 
And I am just going to, yeah, I have so many screens. I'm trying to look at the questions to make sure. Okay, good. I like that y'all are talking. Keep talking. Taj, I feel you on the Jodeci. Um, you know, I'm more, I'm definitely an R&B 90s kind of person too. So we're going to have to talk and maybe get a playlist together after this that we can send out to all the participants so they can feel where we're coming from. Okay, well, let's keep it going. Um, so I think I'm almost out of time. Um, so I want to give you, right, a real life example of, of what we're talking about. I think it's easy to have like this theoretical conversation, you know, data removes the humanity from this work, but it's really important to know that there are like human beings behind what we're talking about that are impacted. And so I want to tell you about Chris Evans of Kansas City, Missouri. So Chris is the founder and president of T-Shirt King, and as a Black entrepreneur, he told us that despite his success, he had trouble finding traditional lines of credit, and he is not alone. 57% of Black people who applied for credit were denied or approved for less than requested versus 24% of white people who were, okay? So this is for my 3% from that last poll that was, wasn't really clear around are there um, institutional inequities like racism and lending. This data point proves that, okay? 57% of people who applied for credit were denied or approved for less than requested versus 24% of white people who were. And we know that most businesses that we start are financed by personal credit, personal savings, and bank loans. Well, the Brookings Institute found that Black households' net worth, $17,000 on average, is roughly 10% the net worth of the average white household. So again, this gets into the core root issue of understanding and unpacking institutional racism as it relates to economic liberation. So what does that solution look like for a philanthropic organization like ours? For us, it was working with the CDFI in Kansas City to produce a loan fund that was more focused on some of these um, inequities and gaps to assist folks and get um, folks like Chris the capital that they need to do what they need to do for their business, okay? So that's how we see as a philanthropic institution where we can lever some of our resources in that way, again, to try to create some transformational city uh, um, system change. So because my time is almost up, it's important for me to end where I started, that Kaufman Foundation, money can do, cannot do it alone, and nor is philanthropy just the answer, right? That's not how that should work. Philanthropy is a lever, and when pulled the right way, it can create catalytic change from our um, actual dollar investment to um, our social networks and extending that to our convening power, right? Like if you pull those levers, imagine what could happen. And so I really want you all to think about like, what is your lever? What does that look like? So I know most of us are still at home. Maybe you're at a desk, wherever you are, get out your phone, a piece of paper, and I want you to write down your lever. Take the time to write down one lever as your call to action in addressing um, core root issues that don't allow for business owners of color and communities of color to have access and opportunity in the entrepreneurial ecosystem. This work is nuanced. It can be exhausting, right? There are so many entry points. And so I want you to kind of unpack that and remove the noise to say, I'm going to go deep here. Like I might not be able to do these other things. I don't have the capacity. I don't have the resources. But this one lever, this one thing, I'm able to really go deep. As you all are writing that, because I'm trusting, I can't see y'all, but I'm trusting that that is happening. Um, I want you to visit our website for more information. So we just launched our Heartland Challenge RFP. So the folks that are in those mink states, uh, Missouri, Iowa, Nebraska, and Kansas, we have an RFP that looks like um, that looks at building on the strengths of um, community in order to help entrepreneurs thrive that are underrepresented. So it's a programmatic grant. All the information is on our website. It launched yesterday. It closes March 10th. We are also doing a Facebook Live to answer questions. So if you are in that region or if you have friends that are doing work in that region, please visit our website and send that information to them. And then lastly, um, like tweet us and hit us up, right? Like social media has helped us be more connected. So tweet the Kaufman Foundation um, with your questions. 
um, you know, at me if y'all got a question and you want to talk more. Um, but I really do appreciate the the time and energy and thoughtfulness that y'all are putting into this space. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you so much for sharing insight from the Kauffman Foundation. Um, that's really all about being intentional when creating equitable communities. We really appreciate you. And I'm going to have to take you up on that offer with the 90s uh, playlist. I'd like to check out yours. Now, let's get into some really practical approaches on unleashing the power of our underserved entrepreneurs. So please welcome our experts, Catherine Montero, CEO and founder of Global Deeds Foundation. Global Deeds is a nonprofit social enterprise devoted to disrupting the cycle of poverty by assisting low-performing schools, youth nonprofits, and corporations to empower disadvantaged youth through innovative education and employment. We'll also have Ashley Spivey joining us on this panel, whom we've just heard from and have, uh, has introduced. In addition to that, we have Taj Ahmed Eldridge, Senior Director of Investment at Los Angeles Clean Tech Incubator. Taj focuses on companies in the energy, transportation, and the circular economy space. Taj was also the director of the incubator at the University of California in Riverside. During his tenure there, Entrepreneur Magazine ranked the region, the Inland Empire, the number four city in the United States for its support of minority entrepreneurs. Taj was instrumental in that success. A serial entrepreneur and proven financier, Taj also serves on the board of Omoja Community, Fund Humanity, and Homeboy Industries. And our panel chair is Rick Cole, Housing and Homelessness Advisor of San Gabriel Valley Council of Governments, Common Sense Columnist as, at Pasadena Star News, San Gabriel Valley Tribune, and Whittier Daily News. Rick is a true expert on cities, having spent four decades in public service as an elected official and executive leader. He served 12 years on the Pasadena City Council, including a term as mayor. Later, he was city manager in three California cities, Azusa, Ventura, and Santa Monica. Cole also served as deputy mayor for budget and innovation in the first two years of LA Mayor Eric Garcetti's administration. He has been called one of Southern California's most visionary planning thinkers by the LA Times and the most thoughtful urban leader we know by City Age. Governing Magazine voted him one of their public officials of the year. Rick and everyone, welcome on board. Rick, you can take it from here. Thanks so much. And, uh, and Ashley, uh, thank you so much for uh, leading us through a very concise um, distillation of both the challenges and the opportunities and, and closing with the inspiring words of, of the Kauffman Foundation's founder uh, that, uh, that it's about working together. Um, we just heard that we wanna be practical now, yet, um, it, it's attempting to bypass actually naming and grounding our strategies in the realities of institutional racism and anti-Blackness uh, in, in American and Canadian society. Ashley, why is it important to start there even as we work to build constructively? Yeah, absolutely. And I just want to shout out my panelists. I'm super excited to be here with y'all too and, and talk. And so, um, you know, for me, again, my roots are not in philanthropy in that way. My roots are in community organizing. And when you think about transformational change that is rooted um, in the ideas and thoughts of and experiences of those most impacted, you cannot talk about the inequities of entrepreneurship without saying and naming institutional racism and how that shows up in our social systems. And so for me, it really begin, It really means that then you'll just be addressing symptoms and doing Band-Aid approaches, right? Like we're gonna create this program that like gets at this or we're gonna teach the entrepreneurs what they need versus saying, yo, we inherently got the skill set. It's these institutions and these systems that are not allowing us to have the same access and opportunity. So who will address those? And so for me, if we can do that, if we can name it, if we can have a strategy that works in tandem to make sure people feel supported while also addressing those institutional um, inequities like anti-Blackness, then we will see transformational change. I don't think we will see true movement until that is um, a part of that strategy. 
And obviously that should inform the levers that you challenge us all to, uh, to embrace. Mm -hmm. um, each of us have an opportunity and those who believe in equity, those who believe in entrepreneurship, those who believe in opportunity um, have, have the opportunity to change these institutional forces and the responsibility to do so. Um, uh, Taj, you, you, you quote Mitch Kapoor that uh, talent is evenly distributed, uh, but opportunity is not. Uh, and you focus on creating and maximizing opportunities. Um, so what are some practical uh, ways in which both uh, folks who are entrepreneurs want to become entrepreneurs and want to support entrepreneurs? What are some practical things we need to be identifying and doing right now? Absolutely. Uh, so much for this and, and thanks to my other panelists. This, this is great on it. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll say this and I'll start with, with the entrepreneurs. Um, number one, continue to do what you do because the innovation and the focus there is what's changing and making things better. Um, but, I, but I also want to speak to those of us who are in support positions, those of us that are in capital allocation positions and how we can really act active change. And, and I'll, I'll give an example of some of the things that we're, we instituted at, at the Los Angeles Clean Tech Incubator to do just that. So we have a venture fund that we focus on in investing in companies that are making changes in climate justice uh, for, for community focus, building an inclusive green economy, because we want to see the green economy of the green tech field mirror Los Angeles and, and look like the, the region. And so how we did that, right? And so what we decided to do was that we decided to, to focus on three areas when we decide to make investments. So the same way that we make venture investments, we added on top of that frameworks. The first, of course, is environmental impact, ensuring that they have environmental impact, because what we're saying is that you can't have alpha without life. And we've seen that in the last 2020 with the aspect of the impact of, of COVID on all of us globally. Number two, we say economic impact. We want to make sure that, that jobs are being created in low to moderate income communities and that technologies are being instituted in low to moderate income communities. Example of that is when, I, when we first came, the ad, advent of scooters or micromobility, they were all over Southern California, but primarily in spaces where there was a lot of lack of diversity. Now, what we, we would decide to do was take this, take this technology and really help our companies through those investments go into East Los Angeles or go into South Los Angeles. However, what a caveat, something as simple as put in a basket on those micromobility scooters changes the use case of that for everyone in those communities. So that's economic impact. And then the last one, which I think is really interesting, is social impact. What we do with social impact is we say, we want you to have a both uh, a underrepresented woman or male, black or brown or underrepresented on your C-suite board or senior leadership in order for us to invest in you. What that does, that quantifies diversity and it makes it where diversity is not just a moralistic issue, it's an economic issue and it's an economic benefit. And so we also tell these founders that we invest in that we will help you find those organizations or find those individuals and connect to organizations that are, that are, 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 are out there to help get those talent. But in addition to that, the reason why we also said board memberships, because we were looking within, we were looking at other capital funders and other venture capitalists to say, if you yourself don't have anybody diverse on your own team to get on their board, you might want to get to it. And so I think those are just practical ways that, that, that funders like myself and others can really institute in their, in their way they're looking at funding and making sure that we're, we're forcing this idea of diversity as value, as opposed to diversity as something that's just philanthropic or just something that we need to do to, to save others. No, it makes economic sense and it's economic value for what we do. Powerful, and it reinforces um, Ashley's um, um, direction to us to be very um, thoughtful and committed to, to deep commitment uh, to, to whatever lever. And, and you just laid out, uh, and I hope people are keeping notes um, uh, of what people can actually do, because this is not about um, an academic uh, dissection. This is about change uh, and creating opportunities. And, and, and it actually um, reminded us, uh, as we turn to Catherine, uh, that it's not some uh, single shot uh, billion dollar company 
uh, we're talking about creating uh, opportunities for millions of entrepreneurs who in turn will um, generate tens of millions of jobs uh, in, in small startups in all, across all fields. And Catherine, you, you really believe in the power of words and, and going um, student by student and school by school and changing the narrative. What's your experience taught you about changing the narrative in people's lives? Again, thank you so much everyone for having me today. Hi, hello everybody who's watching. Um, yes, I, I do wanted to take uh, this moment to, to give back uh, and maybe say things that I wish I would have listened to when I first started as an entrepreneur. And I hope it helps people out there. Um, yes, the power of words is unmeasurable. So the importance of learning and the power of words, I'm going to summarize it into three points and then I'll go back to that. So becoming a, an avid reader will likely turn you into a leader within your field. I cannot overemphasize the importance of reading, not only books, like listening to audiobooks. If you like multitasking like me, I have ADHD. I clean, I cook, I go shopping, I'm listening to a book. Learning is my habit, is my addiction. I love learning. Um, podcasts are great. Case studies can help you a lot. Um, and you just have to understand that everything is changing. So if you become static, it's going to be the end of the game for you. You really need to force yourself to keep on learning new things and keep up uh, with, with, this, um, with these advancements. Like technology is, is changing at exponential rates. And that's really affecting all of us, whether we want to admit it or not. It's affecting our economies. It's affecting the way people do things, the way people teach, the way people work, the, the way parents do their job as parents. It, things are changing. So we must didn't know what I was doing. is genomics like 18 years ago people <laughs> yeah so that whole thing of becoming a teacher at the high school level at Salem High School where I grew up my alma mater changed my life that emotional drive I used to make a change because I saw myself in my students and I saw how the problem was perpetuating one generation after the other and I said I have to do something even though at the time I had been given this amazing opportunity to work at Harvard Medical School. And I was on my way to becoming a scientist and getting my PhD and doing phenomenal work with world-renowned scientists. But my kids, meaning my former students, they kept communicating with me, Ms. Montero, I need help, I need this. And I, I during my lunch breaks, I said, okay, I'm gonna do something for you. Um, and Global Deeds emerged by accident, just out of the need to help the people I really care about. I am not a mother yet. Um, I don't have kids. So I see them as my children. I see every single student as my child. So I, I'm very protective of students at all levels, but especially high school, because they changed my life. So know what what's that emotion within you, because that's going to get you closer to the why you do things. You know, knowing how to do things is just a matter of asking questions and knowing who to ask, right? When to ask and how to do that, that, that conversation. But why you do things is going to help you get up in the morning, in the middle of a pandemic, when you have friends and family getting sick, God forbid, people passing away and, and you're very depressed, but there's something in you that keeps you going and that's the thing that you need to hold on to, okay? Make sure that that's very clear in your heart, in your mind, because no one is gonna be able to stop you once you have that clear, your why. So controlling your emotions, if you're a person that has a, 
a, a problem, you know, dealing with different emotions in your life, ask for help. I cannot tell you that enough times. Please just ask that people are willing to help you. If you approach me, I will likely help you, okay? I pick up the phone, even if it's 2 a.m. I help people because I know how it feels, okay? So do not be ashamed, do not fear. If you need to go through a thousand no's, you only need one yes, that's it. So yes, uh, go read books by Daniel Goleman, helped me a lot. Emotional intelligence is basically the base. <laughs> um, where you're going to put everything else on top of. So if you're not emotionally intelligent, it's gonna cost you time, money, relationships, you name it, God forbid, could get really bad. So please don't take that lightly. Um, another thing that I wanted to mention is self-love. Books by Lewis Hay, for example, there's a book, uh, Mirror Work. What do I do? What's my morning routine? That's the one thing you should ask people that you admire. My morning routine, basically the first thing that I say the minute I open my eyes is thank you. I am not a super religious person, but I believe in God. Thank you, God, for another day. That's the first thing I say. I can see, wow, I'm a miracle of life. I can breathe. I can talk. I can walk. All those little things that are not little, <laughs> the minute you think about not I mean, being without one of those things, then you realize how wealthy you are. If you are able to see, to talk, to breathe, to walk, to think on your own, be incredibly grateful. The minute you build that energy of gratitude inside of you, you're unstoppable. Unstoppable. Okay. So Thanks. go in front of the mirror and tell yourself how much you love yourself every single day. Every time you see your image reflected somewhere, I love you. I love the person that you are and I love the person that you're about to become, okay? And if you don't quite believe in that person that you see in front of the mirror, just say, I'm the future version of you and I am going to help you. I'm gonna help you with this process. Just believe in me, okay? Believe in me. When you say believe in me and you're looking at yourself, you're believing in yourself. So that's another thing. And lastly, please remember, all I've, I've said is the power of words. I talked about reading, words. I talked about listening, words. I talked about hearing. When you hear what people say, you gotta also be careful because you have to have something here called a shield, a filter. Okay, no one touches this unless I allow that to happen, okay? So I decide what labels I'm gonna use to describe myself, okay? I decide that. I decide how I'm going to react towards every single situation, every single situation. And that's one of the most important things that I could possibly share with you guys. If you need any help, please don't hesitate to contact me. Kay Montero at globaldeeds.org. I'm on LinkedIn. If I cannot help you, trust me, I'm probably the most resourceful person in the planet. I'll figure out who could. So please take care of yourselves and, and sending you a lot of love, peace and happiness. <laughs> Catherine, that, that powerful, um description of the way in which we can uh, mobilize the power of words also I think underscores um, the value of, of diverse experience and, and actually um, you you joked and uh, 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 obviously self-deprecating um, joke of, of you're not sure how you wandered into, into philanthropy and yet you bring because of your life experience as an entrepreneur as a community organizer absolutely unique skills and passion uh, that someone who had a more traditional background would not bring. What does that say about um, inclus inclusivity, uh, about, uh, about embracing non-traditional uh, skills, experiences, and insights and perspectives, and the power uh, that, that that can bring uh, for transformation? Yeah, I think... Oh, I'm sorry. I thought he was okay. Sorry. Go ahead. That's for Ashley. Okay. Um, and also there was a question um, that came up that was similar to that, that I think I wanted to also tag into um, where the participant name, like folks that co-opt or hijack, 
movements and language and aren't really making the change. And I think, you know, again, I sit in philanthropy, so we're not a VC, like we have a different means of investing in entrepreneurship and that change. And um, folks are demanding for systems to be different. So when you think about the power that is held in philanthropy in itself, what does it look like when you get practitioners that are coming in that are not a part of that original donor family, that have different lived experience, that their identities, me as a Black woman, right? Like all of these things that come in and the value add and perspective that I bring to that space, it has no choice but to change. And it, it may still be slow. We know that uh, or culture change can be incremental and slow. But right now, between a pandemic, between the um, call for racial equity in the community after the murders of Black bodies, like institutions have to pay attention. And I think that um, for me, that has been my role or what I say that for folks that are in this space, think about what your role is. Like what is truly your lever of what you want to change? You're not gonna change the entire system probably in your lifetime, right? Like it's about chipping away at it, um, but it's really saying like, hey, this is important to the community. This is where my values are. And so I can't worry about the folks that are co-opted in these movements and they're not gonna be successful because that never works, right? So I can't worry and put energy and I police them in that way. Instead, I'm going to pour into the strengths of communities and, and do investments. That's what we see with this new RFP that we're putting out at Kaufman, right? Our language change is different. It, we're not using deficit-based language. We're talking about, we wanna invest in programs and projects that are looking at the strengths of underrepresented entrepreneurs. And so I think that is as you get um, racially diverse um, people with varied lived experience and these very traditional white dominant cultural roles and institutions, you will see the shift that will have ripples into community. And so with me coming into those spaces, I have to say, Ashley, what is your lever? What are you gonna champion? And be committed to that and what that looks like. Tasha, I'm, I wanna challenge you to, uh, to draw the connection between um, clean tech in Los Angeles uh, and t-shirt printing in, uh, in Kansas City uh, and, and, and talk about the through line uh, between um, a more exotic uh, startup environment where, where you're, you're thinking about uh, you know, climate change in the future and environmental in, in a giant city uh, and, and then um, opportunities in the heartland and by the way, vice versa, the potential to do some exciting stuff in Kansas City um, that is cutting edge, as well as uh, in the neighborhoods right around your clean tech incubator uh, to be doing uh, other kinds of, of change that take advantage of the, of the opportunities that, that Catherine's outlined. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Rick. I, I think that, you know, I, I mentioned the reason that we mentioned Riverside is Riverside is a city about 45 minutes east of Los Angeles, that's predominantly Latino and African American. And, and we talked about a lot of the innovations that we made there. Uh, I think, in, and, and I have to credit the folks from the, the city of Riverside and County, because it was a dual, it was a tri effort actually between the university, which was, which I was working with the mayor of Riverside and the county of Riverside with the economic development that really pushed a lot of the innovation. So public private partnerships are huge. And I think a real big part of that, going to Los Angeles, it was the same idea that we did, both with the assistance of the mayor of Los Angeles, both Villaraigosa and Garcetti, and the city council, which I'm so proud that LA has one of the first city councils that's all ran by women, which is wonderful here in the city. But I give those two examples by saying that we can replicate this, and this can be replicated in many different other communities, large or small. And I think the whole idea is that both the public and the private sector can come together to make the innovation and support the innovators that are there um, to making the, the different type of technologies that are, that are out there. And so I think, I think you know, the, the idea that we've seen with, with some of the successes in, in, in those cities like Riverside and, and Los Angeles and, and Houston with Greentown Labs or San Francisco with Elemental, there, there are many different opportunities to really kind of focus on the area of climate innovation. And the reason we're, we're saying this for us is that climate tech, climate change, climate innovations is more than just about a future proofing. 
it's more than just about saying that we're, we're, we're doing things to, to save the planet for tomorrow for our children. We're doing things to save, the, save people for today um, because climate change and climate justice is a public health issue, it's an economic issue, and it's a social justice issue. So I, I think the, the thing for me as, as, an, and as an investor, and, and I look at the things that, that AFSCME and the philanthropic side is doing is that we have a responsibility as investors as well to not only return, return alpha or investment to our, to, our, uh, to our folks, but also realize that wealth can't buy health and that we need to ensure that we're building healthy communities and that our technology is not only providing with, with technologies for, for everything else, but also that we're able to live and thrive and survive with the innovation that we're, that we're supporting and investing in. So I'm hoping, you know, if there's a, is a, if there's a, a, a key word to think about this, is public-private partnerships for me uh, that, that push innovation from all parts of the United States. Those are great takeaways. And uh, again, want to reiterate, Ashley has challenged us all to write down a lever where we're going to take action, that this is a webinar not about uh, just learning, but also doing. W what are the takeaways each of you in, in just a minute before we close here to, to pass it on to the next set of compelling learnings? What are the key takeaways you want to emphasize uh, that, that the diverse group of people listening to this call uh, need to remember going forward? Catherine, what, what are the takeaways you want them to remember? Um. I, I, the power also of collaboration is, I mean, uh, so so important to learn to collaborate. Uh, what inclusion really means. We cannot pretend that only people that look like us and act like us and speak like us are the ones that are going to help us solve, solve our problem and, and the lack of equity and justice. We gotta integrate everybody. Uh, it's, it's a problem that affects everyone. Um, and if there are people that are either on purpose causing this problem or not on purpose. There are people like that too. We just need to educate the public and also un make everyone understand how we're all assets. They're missing out. If we're not, if we don't have a chair at that table, they're missing out. So take advantage of what we have to offer, right? Because it's a lot. Remember, like, I, I don't know if I'm quoting Ayanna Presley correctly, but she once said something like, those who endure the pain um, should have access to the power. Why? It's, it's a logical statement. Because if something is hurting me and it has hurt me since I was little, for example, I'm going to have an enormous amount of energy to, to solve that problem. Right? So take advantage of our pain in that sense and let us run the show a little bit, please. <laughs> Absolutely. Because, yeah. Actually I would say, you know, to Chris's point before I was on listening to him speaking, he was like, you know, I'm rooting for everyone Black and I want y'all to get it. That's where I'm coming from, right? Like, I applaud allies in this space. I encourage you to do what you need to do and critically reflect, but my energy is going into Black folks and communities of color. And so I am... Um, rooting for you. I'm trying to invest in you and create change from the philanthropic sector. And so my call to action for us and something to leave y'all with is just keep doing what you're doing. Keep being brilliant. Keep being innovative um, and recognize your power and your worth in this space. Taj. Yeah, I, I think some some very powerful words from, from, from Catherine and, and Ashley. And, and I guess I will leave us with this as, as founders and entrepreneurs is that we, we have a responsibility. Um, I, I tell founders all the time, when, you, when you're taking capital, it's not just about a celebratory to shoot, it's, a, it's an obligation. You have an obligation to your, to your funders, to your employees, to your customers. I think also as entrepreneurs, as we take this step and everybody in the, in the process, we, ha we have an obligation to ensure that we're leaving this, this nation better than what it was when we found it. So I, I want to leave everybody with this idea of obligation that we have to do. And I know, I don't know, I'm, I'm a founder myself. It's been hard and, and it's very difficult. But if there are any people of faith, I will leave you with this. Second Corinthians 12, 9. Out of weakness, you gain strength. And I hope you get that as well. And I want to uh, close. Um, when Mark 
first approached me uh, to moderate uh, this amazing panel, my first reaction is, you want a white guy to do this? And, uh, and he made the point that I've been an entrepreneur. I've, I've been uh, working uh, as an ally from, since I was in high school uh, of, of breaking down doors. Um, and, and that job is not finished. We have an um, a obligation, responsibility, and a joy of, uh, of working with incredibly talented, passionate, caring people um, who desperately uh, wants to contribute to making this a better world. And uh, so, so joining together to do that uh, is not just an obligation, it's a joy. And it's been a joy to, to um, interact with these three amazing uh, people. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over. Thank you for this uh, opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Catherine and Ashley, Taj and Rick for this inspirational conversation. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us today. Our next speaker is the founder and managing partner of Sola Impact Family of Social Impact Real Estate Funds, the largest purchaser of real estate in South LA. They are focused on achieving market rate returns while doing well by doing good and improving the lives of hundreds of residents in some of LA's toughest neighborhoods. A professional investor and entrepreneur, I want to thank Ashley, Catherine, and Taj and Rick for their inspirational conversation, and we're going to move on forward with our next speaker. He is the founder and managing partner of this Sola Impact family of social impact real estate funds, the largest purchaser of real estate in South LA. They are focused on achieving market rate returns while doing well by doing good and improving the lives of hundreds of residents in some of LA's toughest neighborhoods. A professional investor and entrepreneur of over 20 years, he has been successful at leveraging private capital to drive positive social change. Martin began investing in multifamily real estate in South Central Los Angeles, Compton, Watts, and other neglected communities a decade before these areas became designated Opportunity Zones. Sola's Impact's $100 million Opportunity Zone Oz Fund and is one of the few Opportunity Zone funds that has already been actively deploying capital in L.A. Please welcome, joining us here today is Martin Muoto, Managing Partner and Founder of Sola Impact. Welcome, Martin. Fantastic. I know we have uh, roughly 20 minutes. I really appreciate, um, well, the previous panel, Taj, and, and, and uh, others that uh, re really just that insightful discussion um, about how entrepreneurs of color can participate and, and really make an impact and, uh, going forward. And, and uh, again, I think um, it's really a privilege to be here with uh, City H. So thank you very much for the opportunity to share what we're doing and how we're doing it. Um, I'm going to spend probably about uh, 15, 16 minutes talking about what we're doing um, in, in as Solo Impact and, and more specifically the Black Impact Fund. And then I will try to leave a few minutes for uh, Q&A at the end. And if you have questions, please um, put them in the chat and uh, I, I will try to answer them the, in the last couple of minutes. Um, again, I think that, uh, you know, reflecting some of the comments in the earlier session, um, Solar Impact is um, a, a real estate fund primarily, but for us, real estate is really only the first space of a multifaceted strategy to address the broader issue of racial inequality. And, and we think that real estate is one of the primary levers that can do that um, if it's done with intention, if it's done with um, focus, and if it's really done with a mindful aspect of ensuring that the communities that we invest in and the tenants that we house, that those, those tenants' lives improve and those communities move forward. And so we've spent the last decade plus doing that starting in South LA, which is really a euphemism for South Central, um, perhaps one of the most notorious neighborhoods in the country, if not the world. But, but a lot of that uh, stereotype is significantly outdated, but does reflect the reality that people look at a community that's as vibrant and that's as dynamic and that has a rich, as rich a history as South LA and still 
um, looks at it through a lens that's perhaps you know, 30 plus years old. And, and certainly the history of the crack cocaine epidemic, the history of the Bloods and the Crips, the history of the LA riots, those are all um, certainly scars that, that uh, folks continue to see in South LA. We see the beauty of, of and the dynamism of, the, of, of that uh, community. And we've been able to participate in that. Um, at a high level, let me just, um, take you through uh, who we are and what we do. We have three funds, um, all of which have been investing in South Central for the last 10 years. I started doing this um, over a decade ago uh, using my own money um, invested in a number of multifamily assets. Um, and then um, in 2014, really started my first fund um, along with my co-founder, uh, co Gray Wask. And um, we've subsequently bought over 150 uh, buildings, almost 1,500 units that are scattered around South LA, um, Watts, Compton. Um, from our outset, we always believed in what um, we describe as a double bottom line. Uh, there is an old African proverb that says, um, you know, when people greet you, they say, how are you doing? And, the response is often, well, I am doing well if you are doing well, except it's said with a accent. I am doing well if you are doing well. And that really is the fundamental definition for us of social impact, which is that if, if our tenants do well, if the communities that we invest in thrive, then fundamentally we will do well. And we have demonstrated in a long track record how that is, is, is really true. And, and we've really um, invested heavily in things that are beyond real estate that help the community move forward. Um, but on page two is a quick overview of who we are. Um, we were recognized as the top OZ uh, Opportunity Zone urban fund in the country last year by the Forbes magazine, the Sorensen Institute. We're very proud of that designation because it, we felt that it was earned through um, the work that we did in the community and, and, and the um, uh, responsibility that we took um, to ensure that, that the community was moving forward. And I'll talk about a little bit of what we've done specifically in response to COVID. Um, we were also recognized as the seventh fastest growing um, uh, private company led by a minority uh, CEO. And, and again, um, it, in, in some respects, that's great. And we're very proud of that. And in some respects, we should have had a lot more competition than we did. And so we look forward to other thriving, dynamic, fast growth companies led by um, people of color and, and, and women and, and, and certainly look forward to ceding that position to, to, to other upstarts. Um, but um, on page three, um, I'll point briefly in December of 2020, we announced what we are calling the Black Impact Fund. The Black Impact Fund's goal is to raise and deploy over a billion dollars in exclusively in Black and Brown communities over the next four to five years. Um, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal that came out on December 1st that somewhat pre preempted our formal announcement. And um, you know we we've gotten a tremendous amount of attention because of this bold ambition. The truth is we have a track record of successfully raising, deploying capital, and and delivering very good returns to our investors. Um, but as a result of of uh, you know our our launching the Black Impact Fund, um, and and you know our goal of raising a billion dollars to invest in Black and Brown communities principally in real estate, um, but we'll talk about the other facets of this. You know, we started to talk to effectively every large endowment, um, every large foundation, uh, a lot of institutional investors wanted to talk to us. And on one hand, it was incredibly gratifying to be invited to, 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 the, to the room where it happens and, and, and invited to at least discuss what we're doing. And, and we started to talk about what we're doing in, in, in glowing terms, um, meaning that we were talking about how this links to racial 
um, inequality and how this is a important lever to create a, a more level playing field. We talked about what we're doing on social impact and ESG investing. And an interesting thing happened, which is that folks sort of nodded their head and they were like, yeah, but we just want you to talk to our real estate group. And the real estate group and most of these institutional investors are not the most progressive, not the most forward thinking folks. Um, and, and so, you know, we realized very quickly that despite the tremendous amount of tension that the Black Lives Matter movement and just what has happened in 2020 brought to the country, the protests, there still is no social impact department among most institutional investors. There is no um, uh, department of, of investing in, in, in black led funds. And, and so despite the tremendous amount of, you know, announcements that have come back, um, you know, the, the, at the end of the day, what folks want to hear is how do you as an entrepreneur execute your business strategy um, very well. How do you deliver great returns? How do you create value? And quite frankly, we were very comfortable with that discussion. We just somewhat got ahead of ourselves and really were caught up in, in what we thought was a um, not only a mo moment, but a movement um, based on what happened last year. And so as a point of advice to um, entrepreneurs of color, uh, you have to be excellent at your core business, at your core value proposition, at delivering and executing um, in a superior way before you are asked to keep your seat uh, at the table. So um, nonetheless, we have made tremendous progress um, in, in, in our capital raising efforts. We hope to make some announcements at the end of March with a number of institutional investors and really statement investors that are committed to addressing um, income inequality and racial inequality through a, a social impact platform such as ours. Um, on this page, we outline just um, a number of aspects that we think are critical to really creating that type of change in communities of color. Um, one of the things that was different about our approach um, in the Black Impact Fund, you know, we are going to have two side-by-side -side, uh, real estate platforms. One of them is a um, uh, Opportunity Zone Fund, which is what we did in um, 2019. We raised a little bit over $100 million to invest um, in the broader South LA area. Um, using the opportunity zone vehicle, which I realize for some folks is somewhat controversial. Um, and we can certainly speak to it, but, but to us, it re represents a vehicle to, if done right and in do if done with the spirit of the law, really can affect positive change. And then um, a non-opportunity zone. But we also created a third vehicle, which we're calling the Black Impact Community Fund. And the Black Impact Community Fund um, will be an affiliated nonprofit uh, that will really go beyond what we have done um, over the last decade to really focus attention on four very important pillars. Um, the first pillar for us has always been access to affordable housing. And um, for most of the communities that we invest in, these are rent burdened um, communities um, in which uh, you know, access to affordable housing is a critical part of, of being able to get ahead. And, and again, this is part of our core for-profit business. Um, we've been doing it very successfully for many years using private capital, but that's just first base. Second base is access to education um, in the technology field and through technology. And for us, that primarily means really creating what we call the tech YMCA. These are tech centers that use esports to bring in young black and brown people to expose them to not only gaming and gaming concepts in the world of esports, which is a, certainly a dynamic and 
growing industry, but to expose them to coding, to game development, to programming, to all the aspects of technology, but it doesn't stop there. It goes into project management and marketing and finance because we want the young people to really experience the breadth of what is possible in and around the technology field. Ultimately, they don't necessarily um, need to end up as technologists, but our idea was that in 30 years ago, you would go to the YMCA, you would learn about sportsmanship, you would have fun, play sports, and, and, and you would leave with a one in a thousand or perhaps one in 10,000 chance that you, you could make a living as a professional athlete. We want young black and brown people to leave, leave with a one in two or a one in, 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 in uh, 1.5 chance of making a living in the broad area of, of technology and, and the related field. So our second base is access to education in and through the technology field. Our third base is access to ownership. And for us, this is a critical piece of creating wealth in um, black and brown communities. Uh, home ownership in uh, particularly in, in black communities is often below 40%. And while our core business is multifamily rentals, we wanna create a pathway to provide access to um, ownership and, and what, through what we call accessible housing. Um, and so uh, that means that we were planning on leveraging our purchasing power, our um, sophistication in construction um, and what have you to build townhomes, condos, maybe duplexes that um, community members can buy. In, in South LA, we're building at $250,000 a door or less on the multifamily side. We think that we can build townhomes and condos for 350, maybe it's $400,000, and then sell those at, um, at cost to members of the community, teachers, firefighters, um, nurses, um, what have you, that get to participate in the real estate wealth that is created in, this in these communities. And the other aspect of ownership is access to just ownership of businesses and, and, and really promoting entrepreneurship. Um, so our third base is access to ownership, both on the real estate side and on the corporate side. And in some cases, it's just access to ownership of one's own, own destiny. Um, and uh, the fourth pillar is access to capital. It's always been a struggle um, for entrepreneurs of color and, and women-led businesses to get the same access to capital. And, you know, we are um, fortunate to have been able to, what I describe as punch well above our weight class in getting access to capital, but really creating um, a, uh, a platform where, where businesses can um, be part of an ecosystem that has uh, access to capital. One of the manifestations of that to us has been a project in South LA that we call the Beehive. It has gotten a fair amount of notoriety from, um, you know, from a good standpoint. It's an opportunity zone business campus that is about uh, over 100,000 square feet of red brick warehouses. These are architecturally um, incredible buildings um, that we are restoring, rehabbing, and making available for um, members of the public, for entrepreneurs specifically. Um, we, despite COVID, and COVID has certainly given us our fair share, share of setbacks, but despite COVID, we've leased out 40% of the space. We're proud to say that 100% of the um, tenants are women-owned businesses and minority-owned businesses. We have South LA Brewery coming in, which, are, which is a brewery run by two African-American entrepreneurs. Um, we think it's going to be incredible. There's an Afro-Caribbean um, uh, chef that is um, putting in a food, what, what is called food pharmacy. It's a, a ghost kitchen that focuses on using food as medicine and providing healthy food at an accessible price to the community. So again, those four pillars are what we think when used with intentional impact um, can really be a lever of change. Um, and, and, and so again, we think that those are um, aspects that we're very focused on uh, in terms of how we really move forward communities of color that we invest in. 
Um, I'm going to just double check if we have some questions. Um, and and uh, the um, uh, and then I'll I'll uh, point out uh, a couple of things in terms of how we did what we did in response to COVID, and um, maybe the moderator can tell me if we have uh, questions because I haven't been paying attention to the chat. Um, and then uh, we'll I'll, I'll spend a few minutes there. But if you want to interrupt me, please feel free to do so. Um, you know the, this this page highlights Hi. yes. Hi, thank you. So sorry about that. We are unfortunately running out of time, but if you want to take a few minutes to uh, wrap up the conversation and what we'll do is we do have questions in the Q&A. We'll make sure we facilitate those and coordinate with you afterwards to get some responses. Perfect. Um, uh, you know, I'll summarize. These are a few of the initiatives that we launched during COVID. They were really beyond the scope of our um, main business. We ended up, um, you know, helping our tenants access over $300,000 of financial assistance. We launched what is called COVID Retraining and Recovery Fund, which raised a million dollars to train um, adults primarily that it had been impacted by COVID to go back to vocational schools and, and uh, get jobs in technology and healthcare. And, and I think the point is that um, every entrepreneur, um, really of color, of not color, colorful entrepreneurs, really um, we think should have an obligation to go beyond their core business and find ways to really impact the communities that they're located in, that they are benefiting from in, in these types of initiatives. They didn't cost us a lot. Of it. We had incredible philanthropists that came alongside of us, but we simply created the platform to, to, um, to enable it. So I'll pause there. I know that that's been a lot. It's been a whirlwind. Usually I'm I can go on for quite a while, but you know, again, very privileged to be part of this discussion and to highlight some of what we're doing. And we really encourage others to beg, borrow, steal these ideas, improve on them, um, you know, and, and find ways to implement similar or better ideas in their respective communities. So again, thank you very much, City H, for this forum. And, and um, I'm happy to take uh, a couple of questions or else answer them afterwards. Thank you so much, Martin. Thank you so much for all the insight. And what we'll do again is we'll uh, circle back with you and follow up with those questions. Now, before we move on to our second panel, we want to hear from you again. Uh, but first, let's discuss the poll for uh, the second poll question that we had. Let's look at the results. Let's see here. Do you personally believe equal access to capital? And it looks like we've got the majority of no, 62%, and not sure at 20%, which this is great because we're having this conversation about it right now, and then at yes, at 18%. So we'll move on to the last poll for today's conference, which is poll question number three. Who should lead a campaign to rectify this inequality? Is it the president, mayors, bank and credit union CEOs, or national movement of entrepreneurs of color. All right, we'll circle back to this before our panel begins, but let me, as we know, entrepreneurs need access to capital. So next, we're going to look at how we level the playing field of entrepreneurs of color. So I wanna welcome our experts, but let me check in and see if we've got any results for the poll yet. Any results coming in as you all are answering this live? We'll give it a couple seconds. Here we go. The results are in and it looks like a national movement of entrepreneurs of color at 53% is what most of our audience members here are agreeing that should lead a campaign to rectify this inequality, which is perfect. This lines up our next speakers of experts, which include Fred Wilson, managing partner of Union Square Ventures. Fred has been a venture capitalist since 1987. He currently is a partner at Union Square Ventures and also founded Flatiron Partners. Fred is chairman of the NYC Department of Education's S uh, CS for All Capital Campaign and is co-chairman of Tech NYC. Our next expert is Vanessa Roanhorse, CEO of Roanhorse Consulting LLC. 
Vanessa got her management chops working for seven years at a Chicago-based nonprofit, the Delta Institute, focused throughout the Great Lakes region to build a resilient environment and economy through creative, sustainable, market-driven solutions. She is a 2019 Village Capital Money Matters Advisory Board member, a 2019 South by Southwest Pitch Advisor, sits on the local Living Cities leadership table, is a Startup Champions Network member, and advisor for emerging Navajo incubator Change Labs. She's also a co-founder of Native Women Lead, an organization dedicated to growing Native women into positions of leadership and business. Adrian R. Benton, founder of Onyx Spectrum Technology Incorporated. Adrian is a business owner, co-founder, and former partner at a Massachusetts-based software development firm with clients in the government and private sectors. Adrian has led teams in the development and implementation of software solutions for clients with vendors to improve their business operations. She's often called in to manage projects in the healthcare and transportation sectors that require collaboration with information technology departments. And of course, our panel chair, Marlon Thompson, founder of Future Capital. Marlon believes we are at the moment when we must create lasting change by enabling and equipping a new cohort of investors that includes minorities, women, and LGBTQ+, with the necessary tools to bolster economic empowerment. Marlon is also an angel investor, a startup founder, and has long been an advocate for diversity in business. He has spent the past four years creating pathways to success for underrepresented leaders in the startup ecosystem. Welcome uh, everyone and Marlon, you can take it from me. Thank you for that incredible introduction. And uh, I'm personally super excited to be here and um, be facilitating this conversation. Um, a little disclaimer, I have really strong beliefs on pretty much everything that touches <laughs> this topic. I'll try not to insert too many of them because I really wanna hear from this panel of experts and um, I'll dive right in and start um, with you know, just the big kind of question, um, but I'll create a bit of framework. So study after study will tell you that minority founders have been historically divested from. And um, I, you know, to the earlier panel's point, um, we've seen so much um, light being shone on this issue. Uh, but as experts in this space, I'm curious to hear um, what you think is the biggest barrier in accessing capital for entrepreneurs of color. And I thought I would actually start with Vanessa. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. Yate Vanessa Ronhorst Nietzsche. Um, I'm Dinah Navajo from Navajo Nation. I'm happy to be here. Um, you know, I think for us, what we think a lot about in terms of like access to capital is like we know like what 83% of entrepreneurs are unable to access formal financing. And that's not just entrepreneurs of color, that's like just entrepreneurship itself as a model. Um, but then when you start to kind of slice and dice it, you know, we most, I think entrepreneurs are sort of attracted and or the narrative has only been around things like venture capital. Um, if it's not venture capital, which it would be the majority of us, um, and for native entrepreneurs, that 0% is going after venture capital, what kind of capital are we talking about? And then when we start to talk about what types of capital there are out there, whether it's traditional banking institutions, CDFIs, financial intermediaries, um, in all of those organizations, they are also requiring things that I would say kind of come from a racist origination, whether that's uh, the credit score, uh, whether that's use of collateral. Um, these types of traditional five C's of credit keep entrepreneurs of color out. And it isn't because we don't understand finance, it's because so many of us haven't been allowed the ability to even participate in banking, participate in the ability to understand how our money works, and then more importantly, for Native people, where our lands are, we actually can't utilize the land we stand on. Uh, we only lease our land from the federal government, which means we can't build equity. We can't use the land for collateral or equity. And then frankly, when you look geographically, there are really no physical banking institutions nearby. Um, 
for me, the PPP kind of really illustrated the broken access to capital infrastructure and system and network. So for me, like how do entrepreneurs of color access capital? Uh, we've had to contort, flip, jump through flaming fires of like hoops and have had to continually walk into primarily white owned institutions that built their capital off of the labor of black people on stolen land and beg to be seen as equal. So how do we get access to capital? I hope we can reimagine something different that represents who we are and we can start putting our money into places and institutions that are willing to recognize the history of capital. But also let's start talking about why those traditional five C's of credit don't really have weight any longer. Appreciate that. And I'd love to transition over to Adrian and hear your perspective on this, given um, that you have experience um, building big business and um, acquiring big business. What, what, are, what are your thoughts on accessing capital and the barriers that, that stand in the way there for entrepreneurs of color? I first have to say, uh, Vanessa, thank you for your existence, because mm -hmm. um, I really appreciate everything that you said is, is mm -hmm. things that we live every day. Uh, my family is African-American all the way back to coming here unwillingly off the boat, basically. Uh, people always ask me, are you from here? Are you from, no, we're from here, period. We're from the United States of America way back. We can't even tr trace our roots back far enough. But a lot of things that Vanessa mentioned are things that I've experienced as a business owner in that if you don't have access from the dinner table, so to speak, basically you don't have access once you step, step outside your home. And, and that's kind of the, the predicament that we're in right now. And I really think that in the last um, session, Martin um, um, Muoto, I hope I'm saying his last name correctly, but uh, he hit the nail on the head when, when he said the way that he runs his business is that if he's doing well, that if you're doing well, he's doing well. And I think until we truly adopt that philosophy where uh, venture capitalists, other investments and people that have wealth are willing to share some of that to create some equity, to create some parity, it's gonna take us longer. I'm not saying we won't get there because when you look at African-American entrepreneurship over these last 400 years, it is a miracle that we have doctors and lawyers and business owners and all these other people. And, and it's almost a miracle that that has happened. You know, I equate it to an ant being able to lift the rock of Gibraltar when you look at black people's success here in the United States. Um, but again, it's not enough because it's not trickling to everyone in terms of you know, if you get a good education that you at least have access to a good paying job. If, if you live on land, you get a chance to, to be able to purchase parts of those lands. And, all. and even when, you know, you walk in the door of a bank, there's a lot of unconscious bias. I mean, I told you guys a story the other day about how I walked into my bank and I wanted to get a loan. And at first they gave me some pushback but then I had to push back to them. And I said, well, we've got, you know, three times this amount of money in a money market account. And you mean you can't lend me this amount of money when I've been banking with you for the last 10 years and all these different things, you know, again, cause I think that there are a lot of unconscious biases and things of that sort that have to be addressed. So, so I think it's gonna take some very willing partners and co-conspirators, so to speak, to basically, uh, be able to do things differently. So when somebody comes to your door and says, hey, I have a business idea, taking more of a risk, you know, and saying, you know something, I'm not gonna ask them to go through the whole credit check thing and do this and do that. It's like, if they need $5,000 to start their corner store or whatever it is, that we need to take risks with each other, especially if we can afford to do that. We have people who are billionaires. So, so that's my soapbox. Uh, I'll, yeah. I'll leave it there for the moment, so. I think that's a really interesting um, transition into the VC perspective because um, risk and VC don't necessarily <laughs> get along. Um, VCs are set up to um, de-risk these opportunities. Uh, I, I myself have spent some time working in that that field and now work closely with some venture capitalists. But Fred, as a, as the seasoned VC in the room, what what's your perspective here on the barriers to uh, to accessing capital? Well, look, I think 
I don't think it's just unconscious bias. I think it's conscious bias. I mean, I think there's just been, you know, a bias against people who don't traditionally knock on your door every day. Um, and, you know, it's you just look at the data, you can see it. Like, there's, just, there's no way to, you know, get around the fact. I, I also think that investors, what, any kind of investor, but certainly venture capital investors, but I think all investors, when they make investments, they look, they, they look to, to get comfortable with that investment. They do their research, they make their reference calls, they, they, you know, they evaluate the opportunity, try to, you know, de-risk it as much as possible, as you said. And when they don't know the person and they don't know how to reference them, they've never worked with them, they don't have a relationship with them, that gets in the way. It's not an excuse, by the way. I'm not, I'm not making an excuse. I'm just trying to like, you know, tell it like it is. And so what people in my shoes need to figure out how to do is find other ways to get comfortable with an investment that are different than the ones we've used our entire lives, right? And not just continue to invest in people you know, invest in networks of people you know, and, and that sort of thing, and be willing to expand out to a broader set of networks. And I'll say one last thing, which is you still can check people out. You just have to figure out how to get to know new kinds of people who are going to be able to introduce you to new kinds of founders and be able to act as references for those founders. And that's just work this need to do. And then, and I do think that more people are doing it now because, you know, I think the 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 evidence is so clear and and really inarguably that there's been you know a lack of equity and access uh, into venture or, you know, lending through traditional banks as as was discussed uh, by others. Um, and so, you know, I, I do I do get the sense that there is an effort out there to kind of react to that, but um, it, you know, it's, it's still, you know, a huge disparity and, and I don't think it'll change as quickly as we, we all might want it to. Well, that, yeah, that's a, a, where my next question was going to go, which is, you know, across the board, do we feel like there, the evolution, the kind of mo the motions and tor towards a better, system um are we moving fast enough and and if not um what what's holding us back what's getting in the way well i don't think we're moving fast enough um for sure but i do think we're moving uh and i see it um in in a number of dimensions i see companies trying to diversify their employee bases i see companies trying to diversify their board of directors i see investment firms trying to diversify, diversify their employee bases. And I see uh, investment firms trying to diversify their investor bases. All of these things will ultimately open up new networks of relationships that can ultimately get people more comfortable with backing people of more, of more diverse backgrounds. And so I, I feel like a lot of the important work that needs to happen to level the playing field is underway. But the, the unfortunate part is that it's a slow grind. It, and, and I think what you would see, if you look at the numbers, if you, if you could look at the numbers, these numbers aren't reported, um, so it's very hard to see it. I do think that there are more diverse founders getting meetings today than there might've been a year ago or two years ago or three years ago. Has that translated into getting funded? Not enough, but you know, I think we can take some heart in the fact that um, it's beginning to change and you can start to see where the change is happening. Uh, if I can just interject real quick, some, sometimes I think that uh, people that have means and wealth have to take it to the street and, and, and take it to neighborhoods that they're not used to being in. Uh, I happen to live in a neighborhood in, um, in Boston, which is in Roxbury. I grew up in North New Jersey, so I love the city. I love being around my people and all that. So I made a conscious choice to move to Roxbury when I moved here. And when COVID hit, um, 
there are a lot of different organizations that we support, but we'll, but the decision I made as a business owner was that I was gonna do a two mile radius around my house where I live. So I picked organizations that were feeding people and clothing people and doing all these different things. And that's where I decided to put some infusion of cash because it makes a difference. Now, for those who don't live in our neighborhoods, I think it's gonna take them coming into our neighborhood and literally going on Main Street or, or we have Dudley Square here, which is new, now Nubian Square and basically taking a look at some of the storefronts and, and different shops and things and, and knocking on the door saying, what do you need to make improvements in your business? What are your biggest pain points? And helping to solve some of those pain points for those companies by maybe giving them some cash. Because for some of these stores and things of that sort, it doesn't take a lot of money. It just takes some money at the right time. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so much of it is, is relationships. And if you think about the financial sector as a whole, you know, it hasn't, we've lost relationships with banking institutions. We've lost relationships with um, that financier person in your, like on your block or your neighborhood or on your tribal lands who could take a look at you beyond just credit, beyond just collateral, like they could see that you are deeply invested, you're hiring locally, that you're taking a certain percentage of your profits and you're putting it right back into your community, that how you live and what you do is a transformative investment because it's community driven. And so like, I think a lot about not only banking, venture capital, this movement around impact investing, um, and really trying to create new alternative fund designs, you know, that's the kind of work that we need to be seeing. And I think banks and folks who have created such insular systems, um, their job is maybe at the moment is to transfer assets to those with the relationships because they are, it's going to take them so long to build that relationship. So how do we think about in the interim what that could look like? by trusting the community to know what to do with it, by trusting those who have invested in that place to do something with it. Um, I think that's an opportunity that could be seen more of. And then long-term on the biases part, you know, in the United States specifically, that bias is white supremacy and I just have to name it. And that work is all of our work. However, if we don't like put some, I think perspectives on this, you know, we get stuck in it being like the entrepreneurs of color, the communities of color that have to do the labor, but the labor has to come equally and in hand with those who've benefited from that to really build the policy work. And ultimately, you know, place-based strategies will always have, I think, greater impact because we are a massive community and nation but the ability for us to link arms and why I think naming BIPOC funds or naming folks working in the BIPOC sector matter is because we have to center those who have been furthest harmed or the most harmed and who have been denied. Well, I, they're the I, ones creating the solutions, right? Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna build off that to my next question because I, I think you're right to highlight um, this conscious tra transfer of assets that is starting to happen, but you know, to tie it back, to tie it into the moment, you know, after the killing of George Floyd last summer, there has been no shortage of financial commitments from banks, corporations, VC VC firms um, to support Black businesses, um, diverse founders, underrepresented founders across the board. I'm curious to hear from you know from the entire panel how how you view the opportunity that this kind of funding creates. Um, but more importantly, how do you think the institutions that have already named the issue and and you know declared an intention to be part of the solution? How can they go for go for further in supporting entrepreneurs of color. And I'll start with you, Fred. Well, um, you know, the way, the way our business works, um, which is the only sort of investing capital into entrepreneurs, a business that I'm that familiar with, I don't really understand the, the banking world and, and sort of community-based investing. Way our business works, um, we invest in people anywhere, uh, 
as long as they're working on businesses that line up to sectors we're interested in. Um, and that's just gotten even more the case over the past year as so much of businesses has moved virtual, just like what we're doing right here. Um, you know, we've probably backed 15 new companies, new founders over the past year, and we haven't met any of them in person. They could be in Pakistan. They could be in, uh, you know, Vietnam. It doesn't matter where they are because, you know, all we ought to do is meet them over, you know, a computer. And if they're working on a, a sector and an industry that we're interested in, we can invest in them. I think that's both good and bad for the diversity question. I think it's good because the local sort of community base or place based networks don't matter as much. But I think it's bad uh, also because um, access starts to become a different thing, right? Access isn't so much, um, you know, my neighbor knows your neighbor or something like that. It's, it's, you know, can I get your attention by sending you an email or some other way? So founders have had to learn new trip tips and tricks and techniques. And I'm somewhat optimistic that that's ultimately going to result in a better and more level playing field. But I think it's a little early to know for sure whether it will or it won't. Adrian, how would you like to see these institutions going further to support entrepreneurs of color? I, was, I often call it the black square complex when we saw those black squares and then it's kind of like, what's behind the square? You know, like, what would you like to see behind that intention? Well, I think that the intention is good, but without really involving the people that you think you're helping, it's very hard to really target those funds. Because for example, a lot of those funds are going to nonprofits, which may be filtering those funds into programs that they're doing, but the programs might be useful, but there may be some, some businesses that just need the cash, period. They just need the cash, like literally. If you give them the cash at the right time, basically that helps to jettison them forward. Whereas if they don't get the cash at the right time, basically they're probably gonna cl close down, for example. So PPP did that a little bit, but, but it's like, for example, even with my company, you could see right away that I had the ability to call my accountants and say, hey, I wanna do a PPP loan. This is why we need to do it. They put my whole package together, called my bank, they submitted it. The restaurant I go to, the owner, he didn't have access to to that, I helped them do that and things like that. So, so we have to figure out really how to get the money and 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 um, um, support to to the people. And then and then to Fred's um, comment, I think that if venture firms could figure out maybe how to create a miscellaneous category, meaning something that you're willing, you know, funds that you're willing to carve out for something that doesn't fit in your traditional model, for example, that you know your investors make that commitment, the leadership makes that commitment and say, hey, we're gonna have this miscellaneous pot of money. And with this miscellaneous pot of money, we're just gonna do some miscellaneous things <laughs> to help folks that don't have access yeah. to us or I'll, access to capital. I'll add to that. I think one of, you know, to blend some of this discussion together, we've talked about the lack of network that founders of color often have, you know? And I, I think venture capital firms, banks, government have the opportunity to play the role of like that friends and family um, that come in and support and help get, you know, a company off the ground in the early stage when they don't have access to that capital within their their own kind of direct network. Um, Vanessa, just curious to hear your, your thoughts on this as well. Yeah, so I, I think that is possible if, if, if like, if the financial banking sort of system was willing to do harder work to build and understand that person and what they're kind of creating. I think mm. one of the things that's interesting about venture capital is that they look at more than just those traditional five C's. They're asking questions about a lot of different parts of their business model that um, 
is more nuanced and is more interesting. I'm not saying we want to completely adopt all of that, but I think there's something there. And if we go back to the statistic I shared, which is if 83% of just general entrepreneurs are unable to access formal financing, we probably can see how high of a percentage that is for communities of color, entrepreneurs of color. You know, when I think about that friends and family round, which they say, what is, what is like 30,000 for a startup to, to get access to, uh, I think about our Native American network and Native American entrepreneurs. The friends and family round is taking care of your kids and bringing over food. Um, so how else are we bridging that? I mean, people are building crowdfunding campaigns. People are go funding their startups. It's because they're unable to access that finance. We have to find a different way to break through. And more importantly, we have to recognize that friends and family round is so critical. And the more you look at communities of color and where they have to access finance, um, we're not seeing more risk put on the banks who can take on the risk. What we're seeing is more risk put on the borrowers or potential borrowers. And the last thing I'll add as indigenous entrepreneurs, we've had such a terrible relationship with our federal government. We've had so many traumas due to finance and finance of our lands. To build that new relationship, we have to take a completely different approach. Yeah, that's that resonates um, very clearly for me. And um, we're gonna wrap up here with this question, but um, I, I think a, a good kind of segue out of that is thinking about financial literacy as a tool for entrepreneurs and or as a tool for um, anyone that's interested in business. From your perspectives, from your experience, what role does financial literacy, literacy understanding um, how capital works play in, um, the improving the uh, potential for entrepreneurs of color? Well, a lot of times when you say financial literacy, what people think is they think like accounting or finance, understanding, you know, sort of the technical aspects of financial literacy. And while I think those are things are important, you know, you can also buy those things. You can hire an accountant. Um, so what I think is more important um, it's hard to call it financial literacy, but I think it is in many ways financial literacy is understanding how to go about uh, the process of raising money and how to think about it, how to execute it. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I tell people is that if you just knock on lots of doors, you generally get lots of no's what's more important is to figure out whose door to knock on. And it's, it's not easy to do, I'm not suggesting that, that like anybody could figure that out. But if I was gonna be teaching a course of entrepreneurs, I'd spend a lot of time teaching them how to do that. Because if, if you have what somebody wants to invest in, they're gonna care less about who you are, you know, the color of your skin, where you went to college or anything, because you have the business that they, that they, that they wanna invest in. And, 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 I, and I think that there are people like that out there for everybody. It's just finding them is not easy. And becoming skilled at that is, I think, is an essential part of financial literacy. I'll, I'll add to that. I think that I agree that financial literacy goes beyond um, the capacity to crunch numbers. Um, and, and I think there's a lot of opportunity for um, potential investors or um, you know, folks who have the capacity experience capital to support entrepreneurs within their community to understand the role that they can play in, in lifting other people up as well. And there's a lot of tricks to raising money. And I was telling somebody the other day um, that you can go to somebody and say, would you like to invest in my business? And you almost always get a no. If you say to somebody, well, I already have the million dollars raised, but if you would like to come into the round, I think I could make some room for you. The answer is almost always yes. And it's just human nature. It's like, if you, if you need them, they're not gonna wanna be there for you. If you don't need them, they're gonna wanna be there for you. And of course that's terrible. Like, why is that? Like, that, that, that's part of the reason that we're in this mess, but you have to learn how to use that kind of reverse psychology. And these are just tricks that, you know, I've learned by, you know, doing over the years. And, 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 you know, I think it's important that we teach people these tricks because it's very, very valuable. Well, I think that, you know, the tricks work for some, but they don't always work for everybody equitably. 
And so that's true. Hundred um, percent true. Part yeah. of the whole financial literacy piece to me is looking at the systemic barriers that we have to wealth and and financial literacy. It's the difference between um, um, a black young person knowing how the stock market works when they're 10 versus when they're 40, for example. Yeah. All of these different things as to how you build wealth, how, how, how property plays in, how you know, uh, being able to hand down assets from generation to generation. Yeah, and, I can and, and taking to... down those barriers that keep us from either that information and or being able to actualize those things. And that filters back into our whole conversation around banks and mm -hmm. all those other things to be able to support, you know, support your life. And, and, and it really affects people more who are from here, such as our indigenous populations, as well as African-Americans. Sometimes people that come to this country have the benefit of having learned those things just because of the country they came from and they're able to apply those things here. And so they're able to, to almost force a more equitable playing field in that way. But we're starting from, from a place where there are just so many barriers and it's not an excuse, it's just those have to be addressed in addition to the, to the um, um, financial literacy or wealth literacy. I know we have to um, hop off here, but I just want to acknowledge Vanessa's comments. I think they're critically important to understanding this problem holistically. So thank you. And um, it was a pleasure to speak with all of you. I'll hand it back over to you, Seema. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fred, uh, Vanessa, Adrian, Marlon. Um, I really appreciated hearing the conversation. It was truly engaging and we can go on and on and on. But this wraps up this edition of Entrepreneurs of Color from City Age and Color. Uh, we want to thank all of our sponsors as well as all of you for joining us today. Please go to cityh.com and subscribe for more news and follow us on social media for continuous updates on our future events. Also, let us know if you would like to hold your own City Age or take part as one of our partners. Until next time, stay well and thank you.